Again, welcome everyone. Nice to see you all. Hope you had a good week the last week. Um, the meeting notes are posted as always in the same location um, on the Slack channel there. Add yourself to the quick reports if you need to, if you've got anything to chat about. Um, as far as agenda items, I don't have anything particular that I'd like to talk about outside of just um, friendly reminders about looking over pull requests, old pull requests, things like that. Um, I'm probably going to be working to the next couple of days on getting some of the older ones in. I put a lot of time in to do that really quickly because there's some like definitely outstanding ones that need that should get pulled in shortly. Um, yeah, so I'll probably be, I might be reaching out to a couple of you guys just double checking on things about like where some, what the state or some branches in, if there, if there was anything else that need to, needed to happen. Um, just some of the older ones that are, I know are basically ready, like your, like Tebow, your, your branch from the PGI stuff, I think is pretty close to being ready to pull in. Or it's, it's essentially ready. Yeah, well, well it, um, it, it does, since December 4th, I've only been uh, like merging master in. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, stable. It's, it's been stable for many months now after that. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I realized there is like recently there is like a a test test failing on most of the PR and I'm not sure where that comes from. Um, oh, so I think I, I I addressed it on the most recent one. So every if you update to master, I think it's probably fixed that. But essentially, one of the links was broken. Um, okay. The uh, so in the documentation, the we were pushing, we were pointing to. We were pointing Windows users to a download for like some like MSVC 2008 redistributable package that is no longer available. So the link was okay. broken. So I just removed that since it was no longer available. And it, it was mostly a issue that came from installing discretize anyway. So it didn't really make sense to have it on the Zimpeg documentation anymore. So I just removed it, yeah, but that should be that's, uh, that's likely what was doing it, but I will check as well. Okay. Well, I just merged main again into the PGI branch, so we'll see if that pass. Sounds good. Thanks, Joe. Any other kind of agenda items, things anyone has that they'd like to talk about later on after we go through quick reports? Um, I mean, one thing is just we could come up with a a plan for EM1D. I took a look at it the other day and just kind of so just just to see where we were at and what items need to be done. And I think we just kind of need a, a little a little group of people to to kind of take responsibility and try and move that forward in the near future. I don't think there's too too much to do. It's mostly organization, but just come to consensus. Uh, implement it and kind of get it in. So uh, yeah, that would be something to just come up with a little bit of a plan. It doesn't have to be like right, right now, but just kind of in the next like month or two to put some work into it. Dev, in terms of that, I had a quick comment. I think it was just set a, like some sort of hackathon or something like that, uh, just set a week and uh, just get it done. I think it uh, feels like or yeah, I, I, I feel sorry about that as well because I'm not really putting energy into it. So <laughs> we set a, a goal and uh, set a deadline and uh, just set a hackathon or something like that for a, a certain week. Yeah. So let's, let's just get it done because uh, yeah, that's, I just feel keep like feeling sorry about that and then I just not doing it. So yeah, if you just set the deadline and let's get it done. That seems yeah, like a better that, that seems that seems best because I, I did the same thing. I got distracted by other stuff. It just needs uh, yeah. We there's some organizational stuff. Nothing seems particularly difficult. You just need a couple decisions and then to fill in some some tests so that it passes the the coverage and yeah. We just need to hammer it out over an afternoon probably. So. Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty flexible with my schedule. I think so, Soggy. I don't know if you maybe want to dictate 
when we do that? Because it seems like your schedule is a bit more strict. Uh, I'm pretty flexible in these days. So uh, either like this week or next week. So I think uh, maybe at the end of next week, let's get it done. And uh, setting the deadline by the end of next week. Uh, yeah. So. Well, do you want to just do this Friday afternoon and then we'll see how far yeah. we get? That sounds good. Actually, let's, uh, let's work on Friday afternoon and set up a, a small hackathon. Cool. Sure. Uh, um, 1.30? Yep. Okay. So this Friday at 1.30, we'll get together. We'll figure it out. Um, is there anyone else that really wants to be a part of this? I would like to show up. Yeah. We can get it going. We can just like put it out for anyone that would like to join. Sounds good. Okay. So then I'll, I'll schedule, uh, I guess I'll schedule a meeting. Sounds good. Okay. Okay then. So then if there's not any other agenda items, we can move on to some quick reports. I'll go first here. Uh, so I've started testing I got I had to I realized I had to add something for the deep prop branch to make it actually like work exactly how we wanted it to with um, SIMPEG because we often use it as a dictionary key. We often use meshes as di dictionary keys to things. So uh, it, it was originally failing and that was because I had also implemented part of this like an equality test for meshes. So it would go through like a, an under, like a double equ equivalent method. So you could just compare mesh equals mesh and compare if the two meshes were equivalent to each other. That is not something that currently happens. But as a side effect, because I implemented that, I also had to implement a specific hash operation. So it would work as a hash key to like dictionaries. So there, there's two requirements for this. For two objects that compare equivalent that are equal to each other, they have to have the same hash key. The opposite is not true. Like two objects could have the same hash key, but they could be not equal to each other. But if two objects are equal to each other, they have to have the same hash. Um, so, so because I had implemented that like equals method, equivalence method, we also have to implement a hash key. So that kind of makes the, the what I did done recently is I implemented that in a way that kind of, it's, it's, it has the potential to be misused. And, but I'm not other, because our meshes are not generally like completely immutable objects. We can do things like change their origin. Um, you know, I think we can change their reference, like their orientation, things like that. Those, like there's certain properties that we can change once a mesh is constructed. However, we don't generally change them once we start using the mesh. Like it's all kind of, we set up the mesh and then we start and then we do things with it. So the way that it works, like this hashing function works right now is it creates this identifier, right? That's based off of the properties of the mesh in a controlled manner. And then it just stays, like it sets that as a, like that has to be its hash. It, it only does it once. So that's the other thing, like the hash has to be, has to continue, has to be the same throughout the entire life of the mesh. So that's why I've done it that way. However, that does mean like, by what I said, has the potential to be misused. Let's say, okay, you do something that causes its hash value to be generated, but then you change like the origin of the mesh. It could have a few unintended consequences. The only, the point is though, like this hash, in order to calculate it, it essentially has to make a copy of the necessary items that describe the mesh. So things like it's the cell widths, the origin, the, the reference. For a tree mesh, it would have to make a copy of all of the, uh, like the levels, um, all of the, the cell, like the cell indexes, the things that describe that mesh. Because that, it, it, it's it essentially the same way, you have to do it in the same way that you test for equivalence. 
Mm -hmm. That that could take a while though, that operation. Like, isn't it supposed to be something really simple that happens under the hood? That's why I right now I had done it where it just does it once and it caches it. Hmm. So the first time you ask for the hash, it does that. But then every other time it's fast. Okay. Well, for actually for the tree mesh, in some ways it's not that difficult because you you have a step where you you finalize it. Yeah, so for the tree mesh, it's like a it's deliberate. Like, yeah. yeah, but you can still uh, with the tree mesh, you can actually still like. You could, yeah. You still shift the origin around, so the origin is the only thing like weird. But I don't. That's the thing. It's like I'm not sure how often that comes up in practice. Whether someone like, because it seems to me what we create the mesh and then it's done by the time we actually want to use it. You would think, but then somebody might, somebody always finds a way. So then either, then my point is the options are just to not have an equivalent method. So that way we can just use the hash the same way it was. Like because without equivalent method, it just generates a hash based off of its unique ID, like it's place in memory, something like that. And then the built-in equivalent thing. That's why you can use like user-defined classes as hash objects. So the question I'm basically asking is like, is it useful to have an equals method on um, when comparing meshes? In a certain level, Joe, is it isn't it useful? Let's say like you don't you don't really care like the, all the byproducts of the mesh, but the, if the core property needed to generate the mesh, if you can, we can just check that is same then say that two meshes are equal. Isn't it like, like a better than, uh, I, I don't know, I think having something like that seems like a, a useful uh, useful function, like you've got two mesh and you just want to check whether they are equivalent. Uh, when would you use kind of useful. Yeah, I'd actually, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not, not sure, that's why I asked if it's something, like if it's something that's useful. Because if not, I'll just remove it and then it'll be just like it was. My I was more so thinking of trying to, like there's a, with properties, you can test if two things are equals to each other. So that's why I put it in there originally when since we were moving, removing the properties branch, I was trying to mimic behavior that it did before. My instinct is, is that if I'm comparing meshes, meshes I'm probably just going to be looking at a handful of specific properties, but that that's going to be on a case by case basis. Um, I don't think I've ever used uh, an equals method on a mesh. I don't know if, uh, if others have. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then if that's, if that's the case, then I'll just like get rid of it and it'll be fine. I, I, there's a very long winded way of me asking that question. <laughs> I just want to make sure people had a good understanding Joe, of why Joe, I, I think that You don't necessarily need to deprecate it, I guess, but uh, if there's something like that, and then if that's simple enough to check the base, like checking the base properties. Uh, so the then point is though, like if, if you implement like the double underscore equal, in order to use it as a key, you also have to implement the hash, like the hash function. Oh, I see, I see. That's my point, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really see the major kind of benefit of I having think What I will do is I'll just change it to like, dot equals or like it'll yeah, something it like that like yeah. equals equals won't work but you could also you could always just like okay mesh dot equals mesh to have that return something i'll at least leave us there for that <laughs> um okay yeah i i think i ran into one it's probably related to this but i i tried to generate the tutorials with the d prop branch and discretize and found that uh, I guess it's the projection matrix for each receiver said like object is not hashable. So I'm guessing that has something to do with what you're, yep. you're working yeah. on. You got it. So it'll, it should work now though, because I pushed one that has hashing working. So the next time I'll just erase it and it'll still work like that. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, I finalized that uh, boundary condition branch on discretize. I've got the testing um, 
testing 100% of the difference. So if you look at the test, you should see how it works. If you like to like like see you should if you look at the test, you should see how to use it to do things. Um, if you're curious at how some of those little internal things are done, you can check on the inside. But the test should show exactly like how you would want to like how I would post to use it. So there's um, I've got uh, convergence testings for like a Poisson Poisson like problem. Um, as well as like an EM problem. So curl, curl, E plus E equals some right-hand side function. And as well as like, yeah. So Joe, is it general enough, let's say uh, what we typically do, you do a weak form and then you separate the boundary condition that set it to zero usually, like that natural boundary condition. You assume something is zero, yeah. Uh, but the, like, a, can I actually set the boundary condition in an in a unnatural place? Let's say divergence of E, divergence of J is equal to zero, for instance, right? So you can still actually put, set up a boundary condition on J on, on such a case, right? So which is not natural, but it is possible. Uh, is it general enough that I could do that types of stuff? Or it is somewhat limited to that kind of that the, the, the separated boundary condition that you uh, separated from the weak, in the weak form. It's, it's, it's limited, limited to that weak form formulation for the boundary conditions. Cause that's the only place, like that's the only place that we can really apply the boundary conditions to it because otherwise that implicit assumption that like, okay, you say that natural boundary conditions are gonna thing. So when you do that weak form that, you know, transfer that higher order integration by parts thing, if you disregard that boundary term, that means that you are assuming that that value on the boundary is zero. Like that, that is a part of the assumption. So even if you're like, okay, if you think of the nodal DC problem and you say, okay, J is equal to zero on the boundary for the nodal, that's the natural boundary condition. You can't, like if you, even if you like a, set the value of potential at one of the boundary nodes, it still implies that J is zero on the boundary. That's true. That's true. Hmm. Yeah, so the reason why I asked, uh, uh, so <laughs> I was actually working, I'm gonna talk about that, but I was working on the Dieter's code recently, bringing into Simpack, and he actually used a slightly different boundary condition. So what he does, what's called perfectly conducting boundary condition. So he set the electrical, like he used the EB formulation, but he actually set the electrical field on the edges to be zero. And also that uh, the outward components of the magnetic field at the boundary. So it's, it's like a phase uh, mag to be zero. And it seems like works a bit better uh, compared to our code. So, and that's actually an unnatural boundary condition. So he's, I think, but basically using a finite difference that's somewhat intuitive in that case, like doesn't really matter about the weak form, it's just set the boundary condition. So I, yeah, I was just kind of curious what's- yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a fact, it kind of comes from the way that the boundary conditions work with this finite, like weak form of the finite volume kind of thing. And that we, that's kind of the only real place that we can put them at is that on that boundary integral. Like we can only, right. we can use some of those functions to approximate the values at the boundary. Right, I see, I see, I see. So we can actually still find a way through that kind of injected information into that kind of weak form boundary yeah. terms. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So the point is like this, this, the branch adds all of the necessary items that you can use to probably build up those boundary conditions. So, the, the fun, fundamental parts is that it, it I, I had to implement everything averaging to faces. Like I, so I, and then define things like, you know, boundary outward normals are necessary. Um, right. Boundary locations. Um, right, right. And, essentially like it's all built off of those operator matrices. Right. And, <laughs> sorry, uh, can I ask one more question? So I'm actually like uh, starting to work on the, flow problem in these days. And uh, the boundary condition is driving force. And one of the tricky oh, no, boundary no. condition is like, your boundary is actually at the internal mesh. So 
it's not at, actually at the boundary, but let's say you got a river, then yeah, you, yeah. Want to, you want to put a dirichlet at a river location. So like, a, is it kind of possible, the current structure is possible to put that kind of boundary conditions in? Um, it should be the kind of structure, like you should be able to follow the general structure there. So with our formulation, you'd also have to write, you'd have to, you'd have to be able to go in and put in um, like active cells. We'd have to be able to have an active cells pass to like the mass matrices that we make as well. Because like the, what you're talking about like for like the river flow, the river, river channel stuff, right? You, you're kind of almost excluding values from the PDE solution, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's actually how that the mod flow and that types of yeah, yeah, it's actually simple in that case because they're not using the stegor grid. Um, but yeah, but essentially, I from what I understand, like we would have to go through and put that part of thing into the those mat mass matrices have like an active cell index. So we're because that way, like it does that volume integral, but then the the boundaries should be pretty similar. Like the the structure is the same, right? We just need to define what faces around the boundary, like what extra nodes around the boundary and their outward normals and then kind of structures the same. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, that's great. It's exciting. And I like it, uh, I, I did tests on the test convert, like there's convergence tests for those PDEs, the simple PDEs for on um, tree mesh, tensor mesh, um, curve and linear mesh. So I, we're, Lindsay and I will have to get, get together to see about the cylindrical meshes and see how they how it translates to that. But I think it's in a good spot, at least for right now, to put it in so we can use these building blocks. And the other thing is if we find ourselves having to like create the same matrix a bunch of times, like I, I have a few automated, like, oh, cell gradient Robin boundary condition thing that we talked about before. One for like the edge divergence Robin thing. So if we find ourselves having to like create those type of matrices repeatedly, like in SIMPEG, like, oh, I'd like to do this boundary condition a bunch. So we should probably think about like, okay, well, well let's make that a specialized function and discretize on that mesh instead of having to call it 20 or write it 20 different times in SIMPEG. But it's all, I think the parts are there to construct it. So please take a look, we can get it in. And, um, yeah, I'll absolutely take a look. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting, Joe, because uh, yeah, I think that could make a lot of improvements in our both DC and EM mm -hmm. code, I think. So it makes it really easy to implement like those Robin type boundary conditions on the nodal problem for DC. Yeah. Like it's very, it's, it's actually really simple. Like it, it's a conceptually simple thing. It works out pretty well. Um, nice. You know, it, it's just hard to implement the Richelieu conditions on the nodal problems. Or you're not gonna do that. Yeah. Well, in our problem. Uh, can you do a uh, Robin on the uh, Maxwell's equation? So like an, an MT problem, I thought, I think that the similar idea could be nicely used because uh, like what they call impedance boundary conditions. If you, yeah, yeah. rather than imposing electrical field at the edges, we can just put the, the like a, a ratio between E field and uh, magnetic field, I guess. So I yeah. think that I'm kind it of playing with that. It should be easy. And it's, it comes with how you formulate it. Like if some, uh -huh. some of the boundary conditions are easier to formulate on, like if it's discretized in a certain way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Richelieu conditions on cell-centered or cell-centered solutions to Poissons are easier to implement. The Richelieu conditions on, uh, let's say, electric field, if it's solved at faces, is easier to implement. Hmm. Um, okay. So it's, it's a, just a thought about like it, it makes a difference like where the nodal like, where the values are, depending on what boundary condition you want to implement. That's um, right. Yeah. So, okay, the other things really quickly, sorry. Uh, edited and pulled in that static utils branch on PR. I was able to get the plot pseudo section function to kind of match and extend, like it, a little bit of amalgamation. So it works, Devin, the way that you had it before. Like you can still call it the same orders. Um, I just made certain things keyword arguments and then put cases in. So it works the same way it did before and it works the way that you're trying to do it now. Um, added a few of those tests back in. There was a few more errors that I caught by adding some of those 
like tests that have been counted out. So, uh, and then lastly, they're going to be giving a presentation at this parallel computational fluid dynamics uh, thing. Uh, in May 17th, I think is the presentation date, but I have to have it in by next Friday. So I might be reaching out to a few people. It's, it's mostly detailing uh, DASC and, op and parallel operations and SIPEG that we've been working with. So I might be reaching out to a couple people. Okay, moving on from me. Devin, I see you're next. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, so we just went over the EM1D stuff. Um, I think I should start continuing with the doing the API doc string stuff for discretize. Um, and then it sounds like, so you're making a lot of changes to, to discretize in terms of the, the dprop stuff and this Robin boundary conditions branch. And uh, so one thing I thought would be useful is to regenerate all of the tutorials on SIMPEG and ensure that uh, it kicks out all the stuff that it's supposed to. So uh, I'm rebuilding that from scratch right now on the Robin boundary conditions branch. And it sounds like, do you want me to also do that for the, the dprop branch? Yeah, so the Robin one just adds on functionality. It doesn't change anything. It just adds more functionality. Okay, so that's not going to be a problem, but the, the dprop one is the one we really want to test. Yeah. Yeah, and you fixed that hashable thing. So I'll see if that, that fixes it. Uh, if I do run into any issues, do you want them listed in in the pull, like in a, in a do you have like a, an open PR for dprop or something? And, yep. and I'll There's an open pull request for that there on discretize. So yeah, if I find any errors, I'll, uh, I'll put them in there. Um, that, that's basically it. Just do some not fancy stuff to, to test things and add doc strings. That, that's about it. Dev, I like, uh, that's extremely important. I really uh, appreciate what you've done because uh, I actually worked on the transform and I basically started from your tutorials and uh, that was actually pretty straightforward too. Uh, generate a new material, like basically same, but that different example. So it's, yeah. it's extremely useful. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the point. I, I'm finding a lot of people just go through the tutorials, they, they copy it out and then they just change stuff for their own. So mm -hmm. most people do anyway. So thanks. Soggy and Dieter, who's not here. Some yeah, so, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I participated at the Transform uh, conference, uh, gave a tutorial. I thought actually it went well, and uh, it checks the number of views. Uh, ours actually was the so like so far the best in that 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 Transform. So I thought like it was actually useful. Uh, the title, I th I think it kind of worked, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then on top of that, I. Sort of like I, was, <laughs> I didn't really code in these days, and I was mostly just writing and running the code. So I was just kind of tired of that. So I was looking for something technical and new. So I kind of thought that so Dieter is bringing this EMG three D into Simpack. So, but I think it wasn't really ready to invert, and that like he actually got the JT back in a sense, but that wasn't sort of like there were quite a few things that need to be adjusted to be used in syntax. So I, I worked on that problem as a hackathon. Uh, I didn't really tell anything about that in that the transform hackathon stuff. I just set it up the local hackathon. I was motivated. So I actually spent quite a bit of time. <laughs> and I actually did, you know, was busy. So I actually, I was sorely working on it and then just asking a few questions to Dieter. Uh, and it kind of worked because uh, we got about a, I don't know, like 12 hour, got a few hour windows that I can uh, ask questions to Peter. So I, what I ended up uh, doing, so I uh, developed the JVAC function in, in their side, so Peter's side. So like a, 
So what we typically do this order test, adjoint test, sometimes actually people don't know. Dieter actually did not recognize how that thing's working. So I kind of developed that and I tested his gradient function and uh, developed a new JPEG following what he has done. Because it's basically a, a transpose or adjoint operation of uh, 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 his gradient or JT back. So I developed that on his part and then uh, developed the uh, simulation class in Simpex side. So yeah, if uh, I put a link about the curve note that I, I just wrote a small summary about what I have done. And uh, there's a repo that you can check what that looked like. And uh, yeah, so I kind of did that. And uh, what's act what I thought actually cool is uh, so I, it's a recipe, so I know once I develop that JTVAC and JVAC, if that test is working, I have a pretty high confidence that uh, that inversion will work. So I was actually able to just run the inversion and got uh, an interesting like a result. I can actually show uh, quickly. Uh, oh, uh, can you lend me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, oh, perfect. So this is the summary article that I kind of wrote. And yeah, if you are willing to read that, feel free to read. But at the end, it kind of shows this is the meridian example. So that this is the like a sea and this is the sea sediment. Uh, I think there were quite a few sources and receivers. That's the true and that's the estimated. So yeah, I think it worked. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, links that if you're interested, uh, take a look. Uh, and uh, I thought that's quite exciting because uh, what Dieter Coase does, like it, it is really designed to handle large, like solving a large system. So whereas like uh, sort of our trick in these days is just making the mesh small enough by using Octricode and whatever tricks we have to solve a relatively small system. So I think this could kind of open up a little bit different avenue uh, of, uh, actually solving a large system, like millions of systems, like a millions of uh, degrees of freedom uh, in relatively quick time. And uh, what's kind of nice is it's easily parallelizable. So every, like each solve is different. So like uh, the current parallelization in his code is by source and frequency, which could be uh, kind of nicely parallelizable. So uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that's what I have done and uh, yeah, I think uh, Dieter is coming back in a couple of weeks. He's in Mexico now, but uh, yeah, we'll kind of revisit and sort of finalize uh, that development anyway. So yeah, that's what I, that's what I have done. Cool. I had a few questions about like the, you were talking about, I read through it earlier, um, you had complex data types. Mm. It's just kind of like it's definitely interesting, and I mean, we obviously we ha we handle them differently normally in Simpex. So I'm just kind of curious what you've been, what you've noticed. Because it's it's also I'm not as well, um, it's not as intuitive to me how you handle noise on a complex data value. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so actually, like if you Joe, if you take a look at that repo. I generated as like a dummy complex data type because the current data object assumes that data should be afloat. So, but I think the other than that, Simpack is pretty general to handle the complex data. Mm -hmm. So that inversion module is general enough to handle the complex data. And the tricky part is the, the setting the uncertainty. So if you take a look at that, that document, I wrote a small uh, kind of section about how you can set the uncertainty for the complex data. And what's actually nice about that, you can at least save like a, a one solve because what we're doing, we break apart real and imaginary and then solve for like a real and imaginary uh, when we're solving uh, A inverse of some sort of right inside. So our, like a, our definition of data is real and imaginary. So to do that, we actually solve twice. Although you factorize once, but that is still cost. So, well, I mean, not quite. The, the field itself is complex. So when we do the forward operation, we just 
take the like sometimes we take the imaginary, sometimes we take the real part of it. Right, right, right. right. The, For so, JVEC, it's like not as, and that same kind of thing I think happens in JVEC. Um, but right. JTVEC, it's not really as efficient as it could be right now because we, we're, it's it, there's a bunch of lazy things in there. It's kind of like almost reverse. Like it needs to, we need to accumulate a bunch of stuff and then do one solve before we, and that doesn't often happen in our like EM problems right now. Right, so I think that's where I think well that's what, that was my point. The four problem doesn't really matter, but the when you're solving JT bag, you actually solve twice for real and imaginary. So that's that's what I meant. You solve twice. Yeah. Uh, there, we, I think we, we don't need to be doing that even right now. Like we don't, there's no reason we need to be doing it like that. It's just been how it has been implemented. It's the same reason that we solve it. We solve it once for each. Like different type of receivers. So like if you think about the MT right now, we solve it once for like, oh, the e, the XX receiver, the XY receiver, YX. Like we do that kind of JT back solve each time. But really we only need to do it once. We need to accumulate all of those values into one vector and then do it. Right. I I think if you are actually kind of decomposing that your data as a real and imaginary. I, like I, I saw, thought about it quite a few times. There's no way you can actually evade to solve twice. Uh, that, that was my kind of feeling. I don't know, like it, there's probably a way, but uh, uh, yeah. But if you actually set up a complex data and then it simplifies that problem, you just uh, solve once. Uh, I, mean, I guess that's still technically a double solve because it's like, Two, two vectors, right? Like on the back end, but yeah. Right. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a very gory details. But <laughs> um, well, then I think we've got Lindsay up next. Um, yeah, just a couple of quick points. So I started a pull or Soggy started the pull request um for a governance document in the simpeg community repository um and so take a look feel free to add your thoughts as like a pull request review if you're happy with it it would be great to see like the approve if there's things you think should be changed um like feel free to hold, withhold your your sort of approve until you until you think it's in shape i uh, in we can sort of chat through that if if it's worth sort of having a, another conversation. A lot of it's based on the Jupyter uh, governance document. The SciPy governance document are sort of the two that I looked at to draw some of the language because some of it, you know, a lot of people have already thought about these things. Um, they're all also um, licensed in the public domain, so we are free to re reuse those thoughts. Um, but I did tailor some things to be a bit more specific to Simpeg, like we've talked about in the in the governance meetings in the past. So take a look. Um, feel free to add your thoughts, uh, questions, concerns. What I've tentatively suggested, and I'd appreciate folks' thoughts here, is like a two-week-ish timeline to request input from. And if everyone within that two weeks has approved or if there's minor comments that we go in and address we go ahead and merge if but if there is sort of any um big concerns we can we can definitely hold off on that but i was thinking you know having a little bit of having a bit of a timeline to say this this should be done unless there's any major concerns um within two weeks so the only reason i think that we would do well um if if folks feel like you need longer than that then we can plan for a longer timeline. Um, but does that seem sort of reasonable? OK, because I think Dieter will be back by then, too. So he'll have a chance, hopefully, to to take a look, too. Cool. Um, I put a link into the poster that uh, Joe, John, and I gave at the EAGE meeting yesterday morning. Um, and I dropped, there were a couple links that stood out to me um, from conversations and things like that. So I dropped those in the seminars channel, I think, um, on Simpeg, some cool projects. There's one for an open source hardware for a resistivity meter, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there was another one that stood out to me that was um, 
uh, collecting data for agrogeophysics applications and sort of trying to provide a website where you can locate all of these different uh, types of data sets. So they're not hosting the data right now, but it's basically like a metadata um, search, which is pretty cool. Um, and they're continuing to grow that. So those, those were two that stood out to me. And I think all of the posters will be available online afterwards is what um, Sarah, Sarah Gare was the one who, who invited us. So it's good to catch up with her a bit. Um, Joe, was there anything else you wanted to raise with that workshop yesterday? Um, I, I don't know, just that it was kind of, I enjoyed it. It was fun. They used Gather Town. I just went back in and I was like, oh, I can still get into the poster session if you guys are curious what it looks like. Oh, cool. Well, if you, yeah, maybe you could drop a link in if, if people want to check that out. I'll drop a link to it really quick if anyone wants to jump in here. Jump in there, it should be open to everyone. But see, look, you can go look at the posters. Kind of neat. Um, yeah, so it's good. And then the other one that I have uh, just on the list is that the IAGA um, conference, there is an abstract deadline on the 30th, which is very soon. Um, but there is an EM session and they're short abstracts. They're short abstracts. Uh, there is an EM session. Uh, so if you're interested in submitting something, um, and I'm sure there's other sessions, it, it might be worth taking a look. Um, if anyone wants to do something SIMPEG related, feel free to, um, to share that and you can uh, solicit some co-authors. So that's it for me. Oh. Lindsay, you're organizing that session, right? Is that I am. <laughs> Yes, uh, with a few other folks. So it should be a good one. I'm looking forward to it. Um, it'd be great to see some Simpeg stuff in there. Okay. That's, that's good. Um, so I, I don't quite have everything else or anything else to bring up. Um, anyone else does, it'd be, you're welcome to chat do it right now if you'd like. Um, if not, I'll see some of you guys on Friday afternoon, at least a couple of you guys. So yeah. Hearing no objections. Nice to see you guys. I'll stop the recording. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye all.